we are going to talk about the elusive and mythological few bad apples. You've all heard it. When a story breaks out where a cop or a group of cops have done something wrong, it's always the cops that get up first and say, hey, you know what? We didn't know this was going on within our department. We're going to conduct an internal investigation and find out what's going on. But I assure you, it's just a few bad apples spoiling the whole bunch. It's the 1% that are ruining it for the 99%. And we've heard that time and time again. And then mainstream media gets up and tries to assure us that the public trust is secure in the hands of authoritarian psychopaths. And we've also heard people say, hey, Cops don't become psychopaths, psychopaths become cops. So the question is, is it just a matter of a few bad apples spoiling the whole bunch? Who are these few bad apples? How have they been allowed to hide within the ranks of the fraternal order of police for so long? How have they been able to get away with the bad stuff that they're doing? Because you know when this bad stuff comes to light, there's other stuff that has been happening for weeks, months, and years. So this isn't an isolated case with this individual. And you know that other people within the police department have probably seen what this individual has been doing, but decided to stay silent because it's his fellow thin blue line gang member and we can't break the brotherhood. We've got to make sure that we look out for one another. I got your back. You got my back. If you commit some indiscretions here and there, hey, I'm not going to say anything. You don't say anything. And then we've seen body camera evidence and dash camera evidence and cameras in the hands of people, members of the public showing that, hey, these cops, uh, it sure looks like a pattern. It sure looks like this is something they do as a as a course of life. This isn't just, oops, I made a mistake. This is, oh, you unholstered your weapon? You raised your weapon and you put your finger on the trigger and it was just a kid taking out the trash as, we, as we've seen a couple days ago and we're going to go over that story. But this few bad apple idea is a myth and we're going to uncover that myth tonight we're going to prove that it's a myth because if you have these bad apples getting away with indiscretion after indiscretion criminal activity after criminal activity then you gotta wonder about the people who are supposed to be the good apples and why didn't they say anything let's watch some of these news reports this is from the lupton police officer who left a handcuffed woman in the back of her partner's cruiser on the railroad tracks. The railroad, the uh, uh, train ended up coming by and smashing into the side, doing all kinds of injuries to this lady. So the officer testified in court the other day. Let's listen to what she has to say because, hey, it's only a few bad apples, but it seems like there's a thread line between the few bad apples and the people who don't say anything, and that is they know how to lie. We start this afternoon at 4 o'clock with an officer accused of leaving a woman in a police car that was hit by a freight train. She was defending herself in court today, claiming she had no idea that they were at a train crossing. The woman was pulled over for a road rage incident. Officers put her in the back of a cruiser, which was parked on train tracks. Luckily, she survived that crash with the train. The officer who placed her in the police car is facing attempted reckless manslaughter and a misdemeanor charge, a felony. Investigative reporter Jeremy Hahola was in the courtroom. He's live in Greeley with what she had to stay, say. Jeremy. Hi there, Kim. Yeah, today was a very significant moment in court because we hear from the officer who was facing that felony you mentioned for what she did the night a woman in her custody was hit by a freight train. The officer here claims, this is her words here, claims she, quote, never perceived the train tracks that night. That's despite signs of train tracks and the tracks below her feet. Claims of ignorance. I didn't know there was a train track. I could feel them below my feet. I could see the railroad track crossing, you know, shining as bright as day because of that reflective material on it. I could hear the train in the distance, but I had no idea that a train would come upon my scene and wreak havoc like it did. 
Now we've seen the body camera footage. The footage shows officers doing a felony stop on a road rage suspect who had a gun in her truck. In that footage, you will see a police car parked on train tracks. This is crucial evidence. Look at this. Look at the railroad crossing right sign. Just lit up like the sun with the headlights, lights and the high beams and the, you know, the reflective material coming off of that sign. I didn't know. I didn't know, Judge. I, I claim ignorance. Well, ma'am, if you're that ignorant, you don't need to be a police officer. If you have such a lack of situational awareness that you can't tell that you're, you have train tracks below you and the road, there's a railroad track crossing sign and you can probably hear the train in the distance, then you definitely don't need to be a cop. In this case, Fort Lupton officer Jordan Steinke placed the woman in a police car parked on the train tracks before it was hit by a freight train. That woman, Yoreni Rios, survived. Officer Amazing. Jordan Steinke says she Amazing she's a, uh, survived because I think she was in the she was behind the driver's seat. She was placed behind the driver's seat of that patrol vehicle. And so she's over here. Here's the vehicle. She's over here. There's this huge gap to where when the train hits, her whole body is going to go from here to the side of that vehicle like that. You know that head snap, that neck did something weird. Bones started breaking. Amazing that this lady lived. Did not perceive the train tracks during the police stop because she was focused on a potential threat from the suspect's car. Here are some of the officer's claims on the witness stand today. In hindsight, why do you think you did not notice the train tracks? There's, there's a little Michael Jackson flavor going on here. I don't know if you noticed the, uh, the snout over there. a few reasons. It was incredibly dark. I was miles outside of my jurisdiction. <laughs> I was fairly certain that that particular stop was going to end in a gunfight. I never in a million years thought a train was going to come plowing through my scene. My scene. You know, it's weird. I've been miles outside of my jurisdiction many, many times. And each and every time I pass railroad tracks, they all look the same. How does being miles out of your jurisdiction keep you from recognizing that you're somewhere close to railroad tracks? Does anybody believe one word that came out of this woman's mouth? In the meantime, the victim in this case, the woman who survived this train collision has not been in court, but her attorney has been here inside the courtroom behind me here watching the whole trial for the past two days. We spoke to him briefly about what she's been going through 10 months later. She's taking it one day at a time. Um, this, this incident has forever changed her life um, in, in a way that you know, it, it's gonna leave an indelible mark on her life for the rest of her life. No doubt. Emotionally, mentally, physically. <laughs> um, and every day, you know, it, it goes through her mind. You know, I'm thinking about that kid, what was his name, Luther? Luther Gonzalez Hall, I think it was, who was brutalized and beaten and his foot was broken in like five places by, what, what was the officer's name? Crud. San, Sandler or Sanders? Um, Anyway, he won a $9.3 million lawsuit. Can you imagine what the lawsuit is going to be for the lady who sustained these damages? He didn't come anywhere close to getting, you know, wrecked by a train. He just had his foot broke, just had his foot broken, was brutalized by a cop. And of course it was intentional. So maybe that's going to be a, you know, the different flavor to it. I doubt that this woman intentionally, well, you know, you never know, but I doubt that this female cop intentionally put this lady in the back of the cruiser intending to have her get hit by a train. But yeah, like I said, you never know. They're such good liars. She's not a good actress. You could tell it's just kind of a put on. But man, if that guy won $9.3 million, what do you think this lady's going to get? Yoreni Rios suffered with numerous broken bones, including a traumatic brain injury. As for this trial, Officer Jordan Steike is again facing a felony charge here. This trial will continue on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, and we expect to be monitoring that. So we'll see what happens. Kim, back to you. Well, it's certainly her story that the jury needs to hear, and this arrest and, you know. By the way, that officer's name is Marvin Sanders. Marvin Sanders stomped. 
then 18 year old Luther Gonzalez Hall. And why did he do it? Because he, the officer didn't like the fact that Luther came to him asking him a question for directions, but then went into the White Castle, a restaurant, a local restaurant to ask them questions. He didn't like the fact that he was asking somebody else for questions. That's all it took for that psychopath to go overboard. Urena Rezus was in the back of a car in handcuffs at the time, but there are several officers involved, so a lot to weigh, but it seems like this trial is going along fairly quickly. Yeah, they've talked to a lot of witnesses and they've, uh, you know, they've heard from police tactical experts who say sometimes when officers are doing a felony stop, sometimes they are so focused on something that they miss something else right next to them. So we'll see uh, what the judge decides in this case in the next few days. Oh, that's right. It's a judge. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Jeremy. Not that. They wouldn't miss that. I, would, I doubt very highly that they would miss that. And here's this is happening in the Bay Area as we speak. Check this out. LOL. Putting a pistol in someone's mouth and telling them to stop stealing isn't illegal. It's an act of public service to prevent further victims of crimes. That is a text message allegedly sent from one Antioch police officer in 2020 to another. One of a number of text messages found in one of four unsealed indictments released on Thursday by the United States Attorney's Office. Let me be clear. <laughs> color of law violations will not be tolerated. Then why are they tolerated within the FBI? This is an FBI special agent in charge. This is the FBI. Now, granted, what was going on in, in the Bay Area Police Department, the Antioch, California Police Department was bad, but it's just a uh, grave irony that the folks at the FBI, the, the basically the domestic terror cell known as the FBI is going to investigate another domestic terror cell. This is just clown world. This is why I call it the injustice system. So we already saw what was happening in Colorado. These cops are lying about putting this woman on the railroad tracks. Now here we are in the Bay Area in Antioch, California, where the FBI, things are so bad in the Antioch Police Department that the corrupt officials of the FBI are investigating them for this right here. That from FBI Special Agent in Charge Robert Tripp, referring to someone in an official position who deprives someone else of their constitutional rights, <laughs> which is what is being alleged in many of these documents. They act like this is some new thing that just never happens. It's just it's so rare, we can't even believe it. So we thought we'd descend on the scene and straighten things out. College fraud indictment is one of them. Steroid dis uh, distribution indictment, obstruction indictment. And you can pretty much tell the cops who are on steroids. But if you had control substances in your vehicle, you're going down, buddy. These documents. The indictment describes how defendants boasted about their illegal uses of force in text messages between one another. Within these four indictments, nine sworn police officers and one community officer with not only the Antioch Police Department, but the Pittsburgh Police Department as well. As to some of the charges. Conspiracy to violate wire fraud, conspiracy to distribute anabolic steroids, wire fraud, numerous civil rights violations, destruction, alteration, and falsification of records in federal investigations, and obstruction of justice. The indictment shows numerous text messages discussing use of force on individuals. In 2020, one officer texts this to another. LOL, what did you get? Then a derogatory term for a person of color. You think this only happened once? This is a pattern of these police officers' lives, and when you have cancer like that in a department, it becomes malignant. Maybe the whole department is cancer. Maybe we should start listening to uh, you know some of these special reports like the Mullen Report from the 19, uh, 1994 or the Knapp Commission from the 1970s. And the Mullen Report and the Knapp Commission investigated the New York City Police Department, the NYPD, and discovered that from top to bottom, inside and out, it was completely consumed with corruptions corruption not just police officers accepting bribes but c police officers engaged in overt corrupt criminal practices maybe we should start listening maybe we should take the smelling salts of reality and realize hey maybe we got a police problem maybe they are domestic terrorists after all in another alleged text an officer writes i walked out the tent and game planned how to 
expletive him up. Went back and did justice. Wish you were there inside a tent with no cams. Collectively, you would have loved it, it says. These are people who swore to protect and serve or around their other officers who are doing the exact same thing. Guys, this is just another story this week. Wait till you see the next one. We're gonna keep on going with this though. Collectively, these four indictments describe a group of officers who acted as though they were above the law. One of the indictments also alleges that an officer used his personal cell phone to tip off the target of a wiretap. Eight of these officers have already had first appearances in court. Two more, we'll have that soon. These crimes have maximum sentences of 10 to 20 years in jail if convicted. There was another story um, a couple months ago where a cop tipped off a guy who was about to be nabbed as a PEDO predator. And the cop tipped this guy off and said, don't go there. It's a trap. That kind of guy is on the police force. J.R. Stone, ABC 7 News. All right, let's continue with this East Bay deal. FBI agents busy this morning arresting nearly a dozen Bay Area police officers for crimes ranging from violence. Nearly a dozen. Nearly a dozen. How many cops are in the Antioch Police Department? Let's, let's see here. How many? There are 115, let's see, there's 144,000 residents of the city in the city of Antioch. Police department is authorized and has authorized a sworn staff of 115 officers and 33 non-sworn employees. So nearly a dozen, that's almost 10% of the entire police force has been caught up in this FBI sting. You think it's really only 10%? Violating suspect civil rights to obstruction of justice. The officers all worked for either the Pittsburgh or Antioch Police Department. Cops obstructing ju No, cops don't obstruct justice. They administer justice. NBC Bay Area's Valina Jones was in Oakland Federal Court when officers faced a judge. She joins us live now from there with the whole story. Valina. Well, that's right. You know, this early morning raid started around 5 a.m. this morning. And like you said, this stems from a two year long investigation into both current and former members of both the Antioch and Pittsburgh Police Departments. Some of those officers were here in court today. They spent the majority of the day here inside this federal courthouse. In total, around nine suspects have been arrested. This is a result of four different indictments today. Seven of those defendants were in court for their arraignments. The charges are wide ranging, including conspiracy to distribute narcotics, altering and falsifying records of a federal investigation. And I wonder how many people during that time they arrested for distributing narcotics. Wire fraud where officers allegedly def defrauded money from the police department, civil rights violations and obstruction of justice. Now, during the investigation, racist and homophobic text messages were also found between dozens of Antioch police officers on their cell phones. That's also under investigation by the state. Collectively, these four indictments describe a group of officers who acted as though they were above the law. The officers had no interest in de-escalation or other proper law enforcement tactics to avoid violence. <laughs> Color of law. Have you ever seen a cop who excelled in the practice of de-escalation? I personally haven't. Law violations strike at the very heart of our justice system. <laughs> they undermine public confidence in the law and law enforcement and erode the fundamental rights of our citizens. Now, one of those Antioch police officers, Marisa Amari, is charged in two of the indictments. His attorney says they are still waiting to review the discovery of evidence. They add they're disgusted by this early morning FBI raid, explaining that their client would have surrendered peacefully if he was given the opportunity. These dramatics, and that's what they were, that took place at his house in the very early morning hours today were entirely unnecessary. It was unconscionable. There were flashbangs deployed at his house. He was surrounded, and there was use, as I understand it, of a megaphone. 
Oh, kind of like the cops do to us all the time when they go to the wrong house and they flashbang somebody and somebody's pet dies or somebody's baby is, you know, severely injured and they break the glass and they start shooting people and asking questions later. Oh, got a taste of your own medicine over here, right? This is, this is in Georgia. This is the Rankin County situation where they're dealing with these half a dozen officers who called themselves the goon squad kind of like the jump out crew remember the jump out crew these six officers or five officers right here who pounced on and eliminated the life of tyree nichols guys not one white guy in there this isn't about race this is about and and for some of these guys in the jump out crew it looks like they were you know they weren't too fond of the, a different color skin let's say uh, so, you know, there's probably an element of that somewhere, but the overpowering element is that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I don't care what the color of your skin is. On four, a current Prince George's County officer has agreed to tell his story about the backlash he says he faced after reporting another officer for assaulting a handcuffed teen. Investigative reporter Tracy Wilkins has been following this case for years now, and she joins us with an exclusive update. Tracy. Well, Officer Michael Brown says he thought he was doing the right thing when he reported Corporal Darrell Warmoth for use of force violations, but Brown says he wasn't prepared for what came next, an investigation mm. that yielded a trove of text messages messages Warmoth exchanged with fellow officers that were not only racist in nature, but exposed what some county officials say was a call to abandon Brown and others in the line of duty. Brown says even worse, his own department hasn't done enough to support and protect whistleblowers like him. Hmm, wonder why. I wonder why. And that is the general climate of the Fraternal Order of Police. Hey, don't turn on your own. And if something happens, if something gets out and the public really starts putting pressure on us and then the media starts putting pressure on us, only then will we try to do something. And even then in the background, if this guy goes to prison, if one of our FOP brothers, thin blue line brothers goes to prison, we're going to make it really easy for him. Or we'll, we'll send him to another county or maybe even another state and put in a good word for him so they can become a cop somewhere else. Have, it's happened time and time again. We got him inside running down Davis Avenue. This Prince George's County Police Chopper video shows officers responding to a call for help in October 2020. We go to assist an officer who goes over the radio channel and says, I have one running. Second officer approaching. Corporal Michael Brown said that's his partner, Thomas Lester, stopping a person matching the description of an armed suspect. He's pretty compliant, get him in handcuffs, walking him back to the car. Then this officer walks up. By officer, he means Corporal Daryl Warmoth. This police helicopter video shows the beginning of what Warmoth did next. He chokes him. It starts with a like a throat jab, open-handed throat jab to the neck, and he grabs him around the neck and pulls him away from another officer. Brown says the teenager, then 17-year-old Kayvon Hines, cried out. Y'all gonna let him do that to me. Um, and at that point, um, it kind of grabbed uh, at my heart. Turns out Kayvon wasn't the suspect, but what Warmoth did. I think everyone on scene was shocked that witnessed it. Everyone may have been shocked, but only Brown and Lester reported Warmoth for use of force violations, according to court documents. Perfect examples. You got all these cops on the scene and only one or two actually stood up and said something and said, hey, man, this this just ain't right. But how many things have they been involved in? The, you know, I'm talking about the people who spoke up. How many things have they been involved in in the course of their career did they do that wasn't right and other people didn't say anything? Trained not to put any kind of hands on anyone's neck. Warmoth was eventually charged in a criminal investigation and convicted of second degree assault and misconduct. Mm -hmm. But it was something investigators found on Warmoth's cell phone during the case that led to new concern. There were several uh, text messages that were very disturbing. Prince George's County State's Attorney Aisha Brave Boy says subpoena text between Warmoth and other current and former Prince George's officers revealed racist comments, some made public in his trial, like this text from Warmoth, where he and fellow officer Anthony Brook discuss an investigation involving black Prince George's County officers. Warmoth called them effing animals and said, black people in a white man's job. Brook replies, yep. Or this one, <laughs> where Warmoth texts a different officer. God forbid we make a black person look bad or expose them here for what they are. 
I was very concerned that knowing that there were racist individuals in our department, that we were putting our citizens at risk. So concerned, Brave Boy sent this letter in May of 2021 to the county executive and police department, telling them she would no longer sponsor these officers as witnesses, saying they're no longer credible. The text also made clear how Warmoth and some others felt about Brown and his partner, Lester, calling the officer snitches and other derogatory terms. Then in February of 2000. So there you go. And when you open your mouth and you let the world know about the bad apples, well, guess what the rest of the bad apples do? They start converging around you and just swarming like vultures. Now, if this is what happened. That was, uh, that was in Maryland. This right here is the goon squad in Georgia. Watch these. These officers may get a long prison sentence. We'll see, but check this out. We're talking about five former Rankin County deputies, including the chief investigator and a former police officer with the Ridgeland Police Department. They're all admitting their role in the cover up after the crime. Goon squad in the hot seat, shackled and handcuffed with duct tape, concealing which county jail they're being held at. I don't, I don't know about you, but it does my heart good to see these guys in chains and prison clothes. Six former white Rankin County law enforcement officers led into a courtroom to plead guilty on state charges and what prosecutors call a racist torture session and sexual assault of two black men. Unbelievable. The victims, Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker, both in the courtroom to witness what their attorney called an historic moment. We are ecstatic because to my uh, knowledge, never in the history of Mississippi uh, have uh, in particular white officers been held to account for brutality against uh, black victims. Former Rankin County Chief Investigator Brett McAlpin, Lieutenant Jeffrey Middleton, Christian Detman, who was a narcotics officer, Deputy Daniel Updike, and former Richland officer Joshua Hartfield, all pleading guilty to hindering prosecution and conspiracy to hinder prosecution. <laughs> Authorities say the group tried to hatch a scheme to cover up the crime, destroy evidence, plus plan a weapon and drugs on the victims. Authorities say former deputy Hunter Elbert shot Michael Jenkins in the mouth after Jenkins had been handcuffed and tased. And before he pulled that trigger, he apparently, according to reports, he had that gun in Jenkins' mouth for a minute, just torturing the guy. And then he ended up pulling the trigger. How, how sick do you have to be? And then they sexually assaulted these two guys. Elbert pleaded guilty to aggravated assault burglary, home invasion, and hindering prosecution. I enjoyed uh, the view of seeing uh, the same, the walk of shame. Avon Kerr said in the chat room, not a few bad apples, a few bad orchards out there. Yep. The, uh, the head down, the disgust that uh, everybody that felt, you know, for them and uh, that they feel for themselves. I hope um, this is a lesson to uh, everybody out there, justice. We'll be soon. Investigators say the goon squad targeted Jenkins and Parker after they got a call about a house in the Braxton community Gosh. on January 24th. They By the way, they called themselves the goon squad. <laughs> accused the men of taking advantage of the white woman whose house they were living in. Based on the new plea deals, most of the defendants won't spend much time in state prison. That's raising questions about whether the disgraced former law officers are getting off easy. Uh, being given 10 years or recommended 10 years with uh, 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 with five years suspended or 15 years with 10 years suspended for uh, assaulting someone, for murdering someone, I mean, for uh, shooting someone in the mouth, for tasing someone, for torturing someone. We know that that's not true justice. I didn't really expect this to go on for almost 30 minutes. I, I was hoping to get this done in under 20 minutes. I'll, I'll deal with this last thing where Lansing police are facing criticism for handcuffing a 12 year old kid. And what was his crime? He was taken out the trash and the police said he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So they handcuffed and detained and mentally tormented a 12 year old kid who was 100% innocent. Hey, leave your thoughts about this. I, I contend it's not a few bad apples. I like what, uh, I like what, who, who was that? Avon, Avon Kerr said in the chat, it's not a few bad apples. It is, it is acres and acres of rat infested, pig infested orchards. 
Leave your thoughts about this for the world and the global thought police in the comment section below. It really helps overcome the censorship algorithm. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification icon, give it a thumbs up, share it with everybody you know. If you like this video, maybe you'll like some of my others, check out my most popular playlist and you know, feel free to binge watch. If you wanna support the channel further, Grab a hard-hitting conversation starting with design you can get from the store. You can put on a shirt, any design, on a shirt, hoodie, mug, cell phone case, pillowcase, whatever you want. Remember, freedom is dangerous. The only thing more dangerous is not having it. I will see you in the next video.